Good afternoon, John Colgrove here, a Cornerstone Financial Team. I hope y'all are doing well, and this uh, nice, cool, beautiful day here in Georgia finds you uh, enjoying good health and uh, hopefully starting to prepare for wonderful family times here at Christmas. I hope you also enjoyed a great Thanksgiving here last week as well. It's a fun time for all of us too. So today's topic, we're gonna to be talking on cybercrime, but before I go to that, just a little bit about our firm. Cornerstone Financial Team is a small family-owned financial planning practice based in beautiful Suwannee, Georgia. We help couples, individuals, folks who might be in pre-retirement, maybe new investors, all the way up to people who are in retirement and then past retirement. Uh, so you name it, if there's something financial going on, very good chance that we can provide some help and advice on that. So we appreciate the opportunity to serve you. If you're interested in learning more about our firm, simply just follow us on Facebook. Cornerstone Financial Team uh, is our name of our company. You can also go to our website, but either one of those, you can watch any of these videos. We do a weekly Facebook Live series. And uh, right now we're gonna be focusing on a little bit of a different topic, something that's really in the news quite a lot right now these days too, and on a lot of people's minds, and that would be cybercrime. Now, cybercrime itself, it comes in many different forms. You might've heard it be called ID theft or identity theft. You might've heard things where uh, there are breaches of social security numbers here in the last few years. Lots of different elements of this, password protections, banks. So we're just gonna kind of unwrap a little bit of this and go through and give you a few tips and some things that you can do to help yourself. And we're also gonna take a minute and talk to you about one of the biggest risks we face as financial advisors and the things that we do to protect and safeguard your data and information too. I'm even gonna give you, walk you through one of the scenarios that financial advisors have faced where bad actors, and that's the word we use for the criminals that perpetrate cyber crimes, where bad actors have worked to act like uh, clients and contacted advisors to try to gain access to uh, monies. So we're gonna go through a little bit of that here too. So again, like us on Facebook, follow us online, if you're a client and you're looking to refer us to someone, just simply uh, you know, suggest our Facebook page to someone. Makes it very easy. They can watch videos, learn about us all in the comfort of their home before they uh, pick up the phone to call to see if we can help. So thank you very much. And so we're gonna dive in here. So first thing I would like to do is uh, talk about some of the sophistication and the cost of cybercrime. So in 2019, the amount of uh, property financial loss in the United States, topped $13 billion. Okay, that's with a B, billion dollars. This is a huge, huge risk. Lots of bad actors trying to perpetrate and get money. If you have a credit card and you've been around, you've been using a credit card probably for five years or longer, there is a very good chance that at some point your bank has called you and said that your credit card may have been hacked and, uh, and that you can't do your stuff. I'm just double checking with Tracy, is everything good? Okay, good, perfect, just checking, make sure we're not having a tech issue. So uh, you probably got that call from, you know, I had it with Bank of America once, I was in an airport in Seattle. They called me up, hey, did you try to buy something at Walmart in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania? No, I did not, okay? So we've all gone through that kind of cyber crime, okay? Um, we're gonna go through a few tips and also I'm gonna have a checklist today which I've already made available on our Facebook page. It's available on our website too, and Tracy will add it as well into this too. But we have a checklist so that you can go through and self-evaluate your own risk for cybercrime. So that's the goal of today. Talk about it a little bit, give you some resources, but more than anything else, encourage you to go through and do the checklist that we have so you can self-assess your own risk and see if there's some adjustments you can make, okay? So here we go, a few things. A couple of years ago, we had um, a gentleman by the name of uh, Jeff Lanza, and I'm just gonna show you his book here so you can see it, I'll hold it up a little bit more right here so you can see this well. And Jeff is listed as one of the number one experts uh, from the FBI in terms of cyber crimes. He's been on Fox News, he's been on MSNBC, CNN, you name it, he's been on all the places. So this is an expert in cyber crimes. So we hired him to speak a couple, was it two years ago, three years ago now? Two or three years ago and uh, came and spoke to our client group. And I'm just gonna kind of go through a few of those tips to help you out here first, okay? So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share this on my, my screen and I can already see, it looks like we are seeing simple safeguards. Are we seeing that? Very good, all right. So I pulled this from his website 
And um, Tracy's going to put his website up on our screen too, so you have that reference because you can go pull this as well. But this is just kind of some of the talking points that he uses. So we're going to go through a few of these, all right? So prevent identity theft. This is one of our favorite ones too. The very first thing you see in here, create an online social security account. Um, if you are a taxpayer in the United States of America, notice I didn't say citizen because this can also apply to non-citizens. If you're a taxpayer in the United States of America, you are likely contributing to social security. And as a result of contributing to social security, you may or may not have known this, you have an online account at ssa.gov, at the Social Security Administration, ssa.gov. And I forgot to tell Tracy she could add that, but that's a very easy website. Remember, ssa.gov. In fact, it's even shown here on this. So notice I said you have an online account there. And you might be going, well, John, I've never gone to that website and, and, and credentialed to that account. Yeah, you might not have gone in there and claimed it, but I promise you, you have one if you've contributed to Social Security. So the number one point we see on here, if you've not done this before, before your head hits the pillow tonight, please go to ssa.gov and credential your online account. That's what I mean by that is you go in there, set up, you claim the username. You're going to have to put in your social. You're going to have to put in a lot of security data, okay, to claim it. Because I want you to think about this. If you don't claim it, someone from Russia who's got half the social security numbers of all Americans, and that's what they estimate they have, may very well go in there and try to claim it before you. So claim your online social security account. It is yours, okay? Go in there, get signed up, okay? Uh, by the way, uh, you will know you're on the web right website when it asks you for a piece of information you won't necessarily want to feel very good about giving. As a verification system now, I've noticed that they're now asking for you to enter the last, I think, six digits or so of a credit card number in your name. It won't make you feel warm and fuzzy. It didn't me either, but that's what Social Security is using to really extra verify that you are you and not some other pretend a bad actor, okay? But do go in and do that. Once you have access to your Social Security website and you've credentialed it, Notice the next one in here is freeze your credit reports. It isn't freeze your credit reports first and then try to get your social security account. If you do that, you'll get blocked. So you want to get social security and then it is a very good idea for you to freeze your credit reports on all the credit bureaus. Think of it like this, you know, unless you're trying to get a new credit card every month, which boy, I really hope that you're not, okay, <laughs> we all do, you want to freeze your credit. And when you freeze it, it's going to give you PIN numbers and all sorts of data that then allows you to unfreeze it when you need to. So I want you to think your credit really should be frozen until you want it to be unfrozen. I would encourage you to follow that, okay? Protect your paper. That's obvious. We've all been talked about using shredding, okay? Uh, COVID scams, watch out for that. Account takeovers, you know, just make sure you're logging and taking a look at your accounts every once in a while. If you have a um, someone in your family is elderly, and maybe is more at risk. Let's say it's your mom, okay? You know, for me, my mom, and mom may be watching this here, okay? Uh, you have someone that's 80 years old, 81, 82, and maybe they're not following their financial accounts on a daily basis. <clears throat> you might wanna ask for access to that too so that you can log in and look at them as well, okay? Wire transfer fraud, that's a big one as well. And on wire transfer fraud, I'm gonna bring that one up to what financial advisors have dealt with, okay? Here is the area of cybercrime that a lot of people are not paying attention to. It's your email account. Now, the number one password, I don't know if anyone will know this, does anybody in America know what the number one used password is still today? The answer is password. That is still the most used password on accounts online today. Now, hopefully no one here has a password of password, but if you do, you might wanna change that especially make sure that you have a good secure password on your email, here's why. This is what I'm about to tell you is a case from another financial advisor, uh, not me, just another person, part of our cyber crime uh, re reviews and CE courses that we do every year goes through real world examples of financial advisors. So this is a real example of what happened. Financial advisor working with his client client decides who wants to take a withdrawal. So the client wants to take about $25,000 out. Client and the advisor get everything all set up. Client takes out $25,000. 
A week later, the financial advisor gets another uh, email request, you know, hey, uh, Bob, um, I'd like to take out another 10. And the financial advisor follows through on all the instructions by email. Seems really straightforward, right? Until later, the client comes back a month later and says, hey, what's this 10,000 that came out of my account? And the advisor says, well, you asked for a follow-up withdrawal. And the client said, no, I didn't. Okay, now let me break down for you what happened in that instance. First thing is that in our office, anytime a client requests money, even if it's someone that, I don't know, let's say we talked two days earlier and we did everything and, and then we get a follow-up email. The first thing we do is we pick up the telephone. Now, it, it sometimes every once in a while we'll get an email from a client that says, hey, I'm not near my phone or maybe my cell phone's out or I'm out of the country or whatever it is, uh, you need to call me at this number. Nope, that won't happen. We keep a database of all active phone numbers in here and it doesn't matter what someone says, a different phone number. If that, we look at that number in that email and that's not one of their registered phone numbers with us, we're not calling it, okay? So that's one of the places we catch. Now we've had that happen with clients before and it was legit. I had one guy who was actually out of the country. He didn't have his cell phone with him. He emailed me, said he wanted a withdrawal and here's the new phone number. What did I do? I called his son, okay? It's someone who is an actual trusted contact in the account, verified it. Okay, sure enough, it was. And then I was able to get in touch with him, but we weren't going to act on that. So back to the story. What happened is that the client did a normal process of a withdrawal of $25,000 with their advisor, did everything right, all the paperwork, everything, talked on the phone. And then unbeknownst to the advisor, a bad actor hacked into the client's email account, looked at the history, found the conversations with the advisor, copied most of the same text, sent an email back to the advisor so it looked like it came from the client. Remember the bad actor is now in the email. And then in there asked for one different thing. In that email, the bad actor gave a new routing number and checking account number, okay? So I wanna let you know that we are very aware that the number one risk we face would be someone coming in and acting like they are, they are you. So that's one of the risks that you might not have thought of is make sure to secure your email password. Preferably that you put what's called double authentication to where anytime you log into your email from a different computer, that it will send a text message to your phone. So good passwords and double authentication would be good for you on email. But even if you don't, and if someone does get in your email, you can rest assured we have processes in place here. That person's not getting your money. Okay, that one I could tell you, okay? So I just wanted to walk you through that just a little bit of what we have heard from other financial advisors through time. Um, some other things protect your computer from pop-ups, software updated, uh, passphrases instead of passwords, okay? Uh, by the way, again, you can get this at Jeff's website, see all this, I'm not gonna go through everything in here. Protecting your social security number, don't give it out unless it's a legitimate reason. They all, that's a tough one because anyone who's ever asked you for your social security number that's a legitimate business, they need it. Uh, the USA Patriot Act requires a lot of us. If you're buying a car or, and you're taking out a loan on that car or you're opening an investment account with us, I, I mean, we need your social security numbers, okay? But you just wanna obviously be careful who it is you're giving it to, make sure it's for a legitimate reason, okay? Um, one thing that's important here, I want you to see the second bullet point. The Social Security Administration does not contact people by phone, all right? The number of, of spam calls now uh, just being blasted out where someone says they're from the IRS or they're from the Social Security Administration, they don't call you, okay? They send a letter. So you watch for the letters. By the way, it's always easy to know when the IRS sends you a letter. You wanna know how you know it's from them? Because they're one of the last entities on earth that when they send you a letter, they put your entire social security number on the letter, okay? So you'll know it's from them when you feel very unsecure. Okay? No, that's weird, you can't make this stuff up, but they still do that, okay? Um, but they do not call you, that's an important one to know. Uh, regarding credit freeze, here are the four major credit bureaus, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I always knew about Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. I didn't know by uh, Inovus, I, that's not one that I know, so I'll have to look that one up myself. But personally, I have a freeze on my credit report. So that way, when we have a credit card lost or someone's actually uh, done a scam where, you know, or skimmer, I think it's what it's called, skimmer machine, where you put your credit card in and just grab your number. We had that happen at my household, okay? 
um, that it's you know it's no further than calling the credit card company, getting the card issued, and the and the charge you know rescinded. Okay, so I just wanted to take you through a couple of those. Uh, your tax returns, watch onto those. Prescription drugs. You know, I'm not going to go through every one of these, um, but you can read through some of these. I wanted to take you through just a couple of those and just kind of bring you your attention to it. We've all heard about this, but we want to walk through it. I want to take a second though to do more than just give you the tips, which again, you can see these at his website. You can pull this up. Um, a couple of things I want to do. Number one, if you're watching this show, and I'm going to make sure, I'm going to go back here where I can, I'm going to unshare this so you're seeing me. If you're watching this show and you want a copy of this book, okay, there we go. Now I got it where you can see it. Okay. Uh, because we had him here at our office, I still have a few more of these. And so the first 10 people that request it, if you would like a copy of Jeff's book, because this is a good read on this stuff, simply just message us and let us know. Send us an email, call us, whatever. We will be happy to send one out to you as long as it's anywhere in the United States. Okay, we'll send one out to you so you can have this as a good resource. All right, so just a free resource for you there. Um, now coming back to this, let me take you to uh, another sheet. Are you seeing right now the 2021, Tracy? Mm -hmm. Good. All right, so this is also available. We have this already in an article on our Facebook page where you can click on it, download it. It's also available at our website. So this is a checklist that helps you do a self-assessment to your own risk for identity theft. So, you know, take this, print it out, and then go through the yes, no questions. The number one, I, I really like this one. Do you use the same password to log into multiple websites? Now, most people, the answer is yes. Y'all, when it comes to password management, of these various websites you have to go to. There's kind of one of two thoughts that folks will have. Well, you know, I don't wanna write anything down because someone might get it. I don't wanna keep it on a computer or a thumb drive because someone might get it. So I'm just gonna keep them in my head. Well, when you keep them in your head, the chances are you're using the same password for everything. And if the same password, if your email has the same password as your bank website, for example, that's risky. Because remember, if that same person found their way into your email, they looked and found out, oh, you bank at Bank of America? Well, now they go into Bank of America and using your email, they might reset, okay? So how do you handle this? Everything with passwords has a risk. Either using the same password has a risk, writing them down on a sheet of paper has a risk, keeping them on a thumb drive has a risk. I will tell you what I do personally. I use what's called a password manager program. Uh, there's several of them. There's one called LastPass, you can look up. Uh, there's one called RoboForm, you can look up that. There's several vendors that do this. Everything you do has a certain level of risk. If you use a password manager, is there a risk there? Sure. If you use a system where you're just using the same password on everything, is there a risk? Yes. You have to figure out which one you think has a better risk. For me personally, I prefer using a password manager program, but that's just me. I'm a little bit of a nerd when it comes to this stuff, okay? Um, do you need to review if you're using two-factor authentication to log into websites? When you have, I want you to think of your bank websites, uh, any place that you shop, and then also, you know, social security is going to already make you do that, but your email. If you at least get your banks and your shopping places and your email with double authentication, and that means that when you go to log in, it sends you a text message that you then have to enter a code. If you at least have that, you are really, you know, doing some good protection of yourself, okay? Um, you know, sharing logins with other people. Okay, I'm not going to go through every th single thing in here. Do you receive unsolicited emails asking you to click on links or download attachments? Y'all, this is a really big one. The longer the bad actors spend doing this, the better at it they get. Uh, you may very well have received what looks like an email from Amazon saying there's a problem with your order and you go click on it and it takes you into a site that looks like Amazon and it asks you to re-enter your credit card and you do and you just gave your credit card to someone else, okay? Watch for those. If you get something that says there's a problem with your order at Amazon, go directly to Amazon's website or wherever it is, Best Buy, whoever you're shopping with and go directly to their website and check first. Don't click on that link, watch for that, okay? So just, you know, do you share lots of personal information on social media sites? I'm gonna tell you one that uh, I watch out for every time. If you've been on Facebook, have you ever gotten anything that said something like this? Uh, click on any of these five things you did when you were a child. You know, it's like, it's appealing to you. It might be like, 
you know, for me, did you play with GI Joes? Did you watch Batman on Saturday mornings? <laughs> okay, did you watch Scooby Doo? And you think it's innocent, but what it's doing is that it's trying to track enough macro data on you to be able to help sometimes, not always, but to hack into information from you. So be careful of that. You know, share your pictures with friends and everyone else. Be leery when someone sends you these surveys and stuff to do on Facebook and stuff. There may be a lot more to it than you know, okay? Just something to think about there in terms of sharing personal information. Um, links from friends or family. If someone got into Tracy's email, for example, and all of a sudden she started sending out emails to everybody following links, well, you don't know that it's not from Tracy. But all of a sudden, you're just noticing that Tracy, for example, is sending you an email once every single day asking you to click on a different link. You might call Tracy up and say, Tracy, think your email's been hacked, okay? So I want you to print this out, take some time in this, you know, take steps to protect minor children and their privacy online. Just a good checklist for you, two different, th two different pages of this for you to go through. You find enough yes questions, take a second and try to address that. So when we have some downtime here in December, Take a little bit of time and try to add a little bit more security layer. Think of your cybersecurity as having a better set of locks on your house, okay? If you've got a really good lock system on your house and maybe a camera, chances are a perpetrator is gonna skip your house and maybe go to the next one next door. Do the same thing for your cyber protection. Just add a, make things a little bit more difficult for someone so they maybe skip you and go on to someone else, okay? So I just wanted to go through that with you. So there are the resources from this is that again, we went through this, that you have, you know, Jeff Lanz's information, you can go to his website, wonderful expert, someone that we've really relied on here before too, to again, educate yourself on some of the risks you see. Number one being create your online social security account and then freeze your credit accounts once you've done that. That's two really big pieces of information. Download the checklist that we have. Am I at risk of having my identity stolen or being a victim of fraud? And do a self-assessment and, you know, if you have an elderly uh, parent, spouse, someone in your life, you might go through this with them, too, and try to find out where their risks are and see if you might help them out as well. You know, all together, we can maybe reduce some of this and uh, kind of keep crime uh, at bay a little bit on some of these things. So I hope this is an interesting session for you on cybercrime and how to try to take some tips here on how to protect yourself and your loved ones. I hope this serves well for you. And I hope you have a wonderful afternoon, you and your family today. And we look forward to speaking to you again here next Tuesday at 1230. Take care and God bless.